From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Oh, and hello again. <laughs> Welcome to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis. This is our huge election, pre-election extravaganza version of Chicago Newsroom, except that we just started looking through it and found out that eh, there's really not that much going on. So it's going to be a kind of a reduced extravaganza today. Uh, Charlie Myerson joining us again. Charlie Myerson from Northwestern University, Roosevelt University, journalist, blogger, and I really recommend the Myerson blog. And I also recommend the newstips.org, uh, which is available to you if you have an internet connection. And uh, Curtis is with us today, Curtis Black. Uh, glad to have you guys both here. Um, there's a guy who lives in Chicago who's running for president, as far as I know, uh, so that we've got that on the ballot. And of course, if you're in the suburbs, there are some pretty hot races going on. But if you live in the city, there's not all that much. Maybe the Jesse Jackson race, uh, if, you, if you've decided what you're going to do about the absentee race that's going on. So um, people should still go out and vote, though, shouldn't they, Charlie? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's important. I mean, and, and it is. I believe that on principle. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes even the protest vote, I think, is important. In races, I mean, historically, in, in, in my case, in races where there, the, you know, there's no chance the underdog wins. Right, right. I'll vote for the underdog just to make sure the overdog knows that, that you know it's right, not necessarily right, right. A, a free pass. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's happened a number of times with some uh, some of the mayoral races that. Uh, I've known people who've j who voted for Dorothy Brown just for that reason. Just like, uh, okay, we're, we know the old guy's <laughs> going to win, but, you know, somebody's got to, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's important. Yeah, okay. Um, but we do have some referenda on some ballots. If you're in about 200 precincts in the city, and I don't really understand the history of how that happened. I know that Joe Moore... Uh, did uh, the mayor's bidding in, in preventing everyone from having the opportunity to vote on whether or not we should have an elected school board. But somehow or other, it got on the ballot in about a couple hundred places. Uh, yeah, that was the work of parent and community groups that... That want, worked individually in their... Yeah, that passed it in their own precincts. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and after re the remap, it's on about, in parts, of about 325. Oh, it's 325. Something like okay. that. Okay, right. but that's still a, it's still a minority of precincts, certainly. A, a big minority. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, w w what is the question? What what are what are people being asked in people those? People are being asked whether Chicago sh Chicago should have an elected school board after 15 years of mayoral control. Um, a lot of these groups are just frustrated with a school board that doesn't ever that doesn't seem to be anything but a rubber stamp. Yeah. That doesn't take much at all of community uh, input uh, and th that has committees that don't function, that, that does all its, you know, there, uh, at one of these forums, um, there have been a number of forums on this, and, and, and one, of the, one of the experts, Pauline Lippman, did a study of elected school boards, which are 96% of school boards, and, and they hold meetings in the evening, they, they <laughs> debate openly, they vote openly, they have divided uh, votes, they, yeah, you know, yeah. it's completely different from what we have where if you want right. to testify, you have to show up at six o'clock in the morning right, and stand right. on line, you get two minutes, they don't listen to you, they go into executive session, make all their decisions, they come out and vote on a list of... And, and the problem with that is what? Well, the problem with an elected school board? <laughs> the, the problem with the system that you're describing is what? I mean, I guess there's no the problem. It's very, a, it's very efficient. It's a, yeah. <laughs> it is efficient. There's, it, it, it's, what's the point of having the school board if it doesn't really oh, add any oh, value Curtis, that way? Curtis, you and, you and these community <laughs> groups who, I, I don't know, I just don't understand. I mean, look, you get the chance to address the school board with your with your concern. You get a minute or two, and people are sitting there texting and, you know, carrying on other conversations. And then when it's over, as you said, they go into executive session. But, it, of course, we, we make light of this, but the fact of the matter is that this is the system that Mayor Daley was able to put in place, as you say, many years ago. But even before that, it wasn't really an elected school board. Chicago, as I understand it, has pretty much never had an elected school board board it's been a kind of a hybrid there, so there, there was a, co a citizens commission that would nominate members right. and the mayor would pick from that I, unless he didn't want to right right there was some work around <laughs> for that right. sure. there were always those problems when the citizens commission would nominate someone the mayor didn't want so then the mayor would just 
leave that seat vacant, which the mayor had the, uh, the choice to do. But so anyway, there, there, there is a referendum. It doesn't really have much effect other than, uh, to be serious about it, to take the gauge of the level of unrest that there is among the citizenry about whether this, this system, is it's time to change the system a little bit. Yeah, I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction among the group of people who try, uh, parents and uh, community activists who tried to uh, try to impact CPS policy and seem they can have no impact at all. And I think there's a l larger level of concern after the school strike and all the school closings. And I think anyone who interfaces with CPS finds it a rather difficult thing to do. That's always been the case. I mean, for years and years and years, interfacing with the school board has been tough. You know, we just went through this strike, a major crisis for the Chicago educational school system, the educational system. And does anybody remember anybody from the school board at any point playing a significant role in, in the unfolding of that? Well, the, 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 the president of the school board did. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and, and, he, and he, it, he kind of emerged in the, in the vacuum that was left with J.C. Brazar. In, the, in the, the crisis leading up to yeah, it, yeah, yeah, the school it, board it, was a non Right, right. Oh, yeah, no one could name was, anyone was, other was, than right. Penny Pritzker. Everybody right. can name Penny Pritzker, so, the poor woman. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think from the point of view of people who will be voting in this, there's, there's reason to say, well, let's see how it might work differently. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, there, there has been a good deal of debate about this. I've been to some of these forums, and there, there's been some very interesting conversation going on about, okay, great, so then that just means that, you know, Karl Rove is going to start sending money to, uh, to, to put a, uh, a charter school slate up or something like that, or and, the unions or whatever. And Greg Hines has a column now saying it would, that it's a little, Extreme, I think, uh, the idea that the CTU would take over the school board and be negotiating with itself through this election. I don't mm -hmm. think there's a school board in the country where most, almost all of them are elected, where the teachers union mm -hmm. runs it. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, but it, the, so that's that's part of the. Fear but but that's going but if on. you look at the way it is, uh, something ought to be done to make it right, work right. more well, responsive. Well, we we certainly have a situation where I think it's fair to say most people are pretty unhappy with the way it has emerged and. And that seems to have happened since uh, Rahm Emanuel appointed his school board. But anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. Now, there's another one that I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but uh, and I must say that it 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 confuses me. I'm not completely <laughs> clear on this, and I'm easily confused. <laughs> but the, but there is a statewide referendum on it's the first thing on the ballot. It, it is, is okay, it really, yeah. and it is about the um, about pensions and how pensions can be increased, right? It, it prohibits the people who vote on pensions from, from advancing pensions unless they get a three-fifth majority. Mm -hmm. Is there any logic for this? Is there, is there any, I mean, I, I, all I've seen is editorials, everyone, on, on all sides. I mean, like the business community, the labor, everybody is saying vote no on this, it's stupid. The editorials in all the newspapers that still do editorials have said vote no. I think there is some logic, and that's that the politicians in Springfield who aren't uh, wanting to deal with this want to look like they're dealing with this. It's cover. It feels like cover. Oh, so then it does have a it does oh, have an absolutely. important civic <laughs> role. <laughs> yeah, we did this. We made it. Po we made it. Uh, however bad our crisis is now, uh -huh. we've just taken a responsible step <laughs> to make sure that it won't get substantially worse. We've just taken a responsible step to make sure that we don't look any worse. <laughs> That's right. So vote for us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. But it's not exactly that. I mean, it, it doesn't really have that impact. Uh huh. Uh, to some extent, these three fifths votes, uh, wherever they're required, just give cover. To the majority. Well, I voted for it, but we didn't have enough votes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah, voted yeah, for. Yeah, I yeah, voted yeah. to raise pension increase, so, but you know, a small minority stopped us from doing it. So, hey, teachers in our little suburban town or our rural township uh, in southern Illinois, we really wanted to give you a raise, and I, I voted for it, but I couldn't get past the three fifths. That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah okay. And uh, the other, the other question again. One of the, one of the objections to it is, is the concept that. Should the state tie the hands of those local school boards, some right, of whom may right. have legitimate reasons right. for increasing benefits? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, it's a it's a large and complex state with very different school systems, and some might have a one size fits all is not a good is not a good. So, the the large number of important and influential people who have been urging 
citizenry to vote no on this have a legitimate reason for saying that you're you seem to be both saying I think so although there there is uh, you know a, a I guess a legitimate argument to be made for the fact that all right we've gotten in this mess because it's been easy for legislative bodies school boards and other agencies to to raise pensions mm -hmm. so this at least will stop it from getting worse right. you're right. going to make it much more difficult well, I mean, to, it, to come up with those easy votes. It's been said a hundred times that the the people who got us into this mess are the school board people and the and the people in the state legislature who just year after year kept voting for pensions but never voting for the appropriation to put the money in the pot. The thing is, I don't think most of those votes were very close to begin with. I'm not sure that in many of those cases three fifths would have made a difference. But right. you know, most of right. these the budget votes tend to pass by substantial right, majorities. Right. Which, which was my other question. It's like the three-fifths thing, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that a lot of, a lot of school boards, uh, they, they voted by a lot more than three-fifths, and certainly the legislature did. So, so that's our election wrap-up, folks. <laughs> <laughs> vote early, vote often. Yes. Hope you voted early, yeah, because after all, Congressman Jackson has voted early, so so should you. <laughs> He's not even going to have an election eve, or election night event of any kind. Have you ever uh, seen anything like this? You've been, you've covered news well, for a long you time. Know, it, not recently. <laughs> there, there, there have been congressmen who became s indisposed, sick, yeah. seriously ill, In who coma, who hung like, yeah. who hung on for, yeah. to their seat for a long time. Yeah. I, have they been through an election in that? I don't know. I mean, status. dead people have been reelected. Right. We've yes. seen that, but this is a completely different thing. This has been going on for a really long time, and it it just seems so surreal. I mean, you would think that the guy, as far as we know, according to reliable press reports, he's been seen around D.C. in in public establishments, like smoking a cigar, bars, yeah, and stuff. Right. So you would think that he could just come to the district. I mean, maybe he can't afford a plane ticket. Maybe that's the problem. But somebody could have gone and picked him up and driven him home just for an hour. He could have just stood up and said, hi, everybody. I'm really sick. I got to go, but thanks for voting for me. What's the upside? I mean, from Jesse Jackson Jr.'s point of view, what's the upside to that? You know, he's got, it, it seems likely he'll win re-election. He's uh -huh. going to win re-election regardless of what he does. Uh -huh. So he really doesn't have to interact with the public. He did, seems to he be the did case. do a tele-message tele to all Yeah, he could, he, could have, he could have sent a video, yeah. right. He could have done he something. He did do that. Right. Oh, he did. Yes, okay. yes, yes. That's yes. right. He did. he did a YouTube Automated. thing. Automated. Oh, yeah. did, yeah, yeah, okay. did. No, he did a robocall. Uh, yeah, right. robocall. Robocall. Yes, all right. Well, today is a very important day. We are all either journalists or quasi-journalists or, or <laughs> former journalists or something. Or we all, we all hang in the journalism. It's a broad act. umbrella. I right. think we're all under it. It's a big day for journalism in Chicago. The uh, Chicago Tribune Digital Plus has uh, gone online. It's, it's now official. If you want to see the premium content in the venerable Chicago Tribune, you got to pay. What do you think? Now, you used to work for the Tribune. I did. In fact, you used to work for the digital side of I the did. Chicago Tribune. So uh, you are a really good person to ask about this. Not that good, actually, because I was in such a hurry to dress up and look good for you today <laughs> that I left the house. You look like a Tribune employee. Right? Right. Well, I did my best. Mm -hmm. uh, so I haven't. I actually haven't had a chance to experience this this new paywall on, on the Tribune side. Are you a member? Uh, you, we, we, we're a home subscriber. subscriber. Okay, all right. So you're a home uh, so subscriber. A home subscriber. So, yeah. so it should be free. I think it's free to us. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. I have concerns about paywalls in general. I voice them both as an employee of the Tribune Company and a, a, as an observer now of the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. To the extent they keep the industry alive uh, and and financially healthy, and there are indications that for many newspapers it's doing that. I think that's a good thing. I don't think it's an end-all solution. I don't think it's the long-range solution to the news industry's problems. Well, now we saw an interesting thing yesterday from the Audit Bureau of Circulations, the national agency that monitors circulation at newspapers, and there were some. I thought fascinating uh, numbers there that in this quarter the um, circulation at uh, they have like 500 newspapers that they sample I guess and uh, mm -hmm. anyway the, the 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 big news was that the circulation in these 500 newspapers did not go down it actually went up like 0.6 percent <laughs> I mean we're living in a time when 0.6 percent increases right, like we did break it. off the That's champagne right. That's right. Every, the happy days are here again. we didn't tank right so I mean now of course that 
there was about a 200,000 or something slide in printed editions, but very, very small. It basically is holding still, and the increase is because of people signing up for digital. So, I mean, this all figures into this in some way. It's like if, if, if the circulation slide that has been kind of like about this trajectory is now suddenly looking like this, even though it's almost at the bottom, yeah. hey, you know, at least it didn't smash into the ground. Well, the, you know, there's a question of whether it's going to be down <laughs> like this here and we go, you know, how long will it stay there? And is it, are right. we just, you know, at, yeah. on the edge of a cliff or right. are we at the bottom of a valley? But I mean, I, I guess what I'm asking you guys is, is are we kind of at that point where we're at a sort of a critical number now of people who really do understand and appreciate that journalism is a vital part of our of our body politic and that it needs to be supported? I mean, do you, do you get that feeling? I don't get the feeling that, <laughs> Thanks, <okay. laughs> that well, uh, you know people what? are buying the newspapers <laughs> because they up. want to support journalism. <laughs> I think people are buying the newspapers. The ones who are buying them is because they like newspapers. Okay, all right, I'll but, buy that. All but right. still, there are a quarter million people getting a Sun Times every day, aren't there? And something like three or four hundred thousand getting the Tribune. That's an awful lot of people. I think that's more than are going to Huffington Post mm -hmm, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. or There's still forces to be reckoned with. Uh, it, but I, uh, I like to quote, and I, I think I'm going to get this quote close to accurate. I think it was at techdirt.com. I uh, had a headline several months ago, something like, uh, Go ahead, newspapers, keep putting up silly paywalls and make it possible for us smaller news organizations to now I'm way off <laughs> the quote, but you know, it make it clear the way for us to keep growing free audience, mm -hmm. advertiser supported audience that will grow. Yeah, Terrible but, quote. Uh, oh, but that, you uh, get the yeah, gist of it. But I get the gist of it. But right. why is an advertiser going to support a small, independent, little voice if it's not going to support the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, the Tribune? Well, they, they, they don't until it begins to grow. Yeah. And there are, you know, a number of news sources that are growing. Mm -hmm. Are they Tech Buzz, you know, to be one which has a legitimate DC based mm -hmm. news organization, BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I'm sorry, BuzzFeed has the Buzz DC Feed, organization. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, the, the ecosystem is such that th these entities are gonna grow or can grow. And paywall is to some extent a limiting factor on the growth of traditional media. I mean mm -hmm. there's only so many people who are gonna pay. Yeah. There's an unlimited yeah. number of people who will look for free, or at least potentially an unlimited number of people. So in the long run, I think someone's going to solve the problem of getting to the point where the free advertiser-supported audience is enough to support a, a, a legacy expense-free news gathering organization, one that doesn't have to pay for printing presses and delivery mm -hmm. trucks. And it's so the right I, size. I mean, I know this is this is just this is like the oldest question that's been kicked around forever. But will we ever reach a point where there will be some stability in careers in journalism, or or is that really just are we just kind of like that's just so two thousand? I've been talking, Curtis. I'm right a, I I don't know. I I see a whole trend in the economy that this may be part of of much more insecure contingent employment across the board and. Mm -hmm much less retirement security, job security, everything. So we're I'm all afraid that this is Fox just part of that. You're saying. We're I'm all afraid, yeah. yeah. I was really encouraged by what I saw on Twitter uh, Monday night. You blogged about this the other day, and I, I thought did. it was a very good blog, and you, you got quite a bit of response to it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, in a sense, the, the, the world is changing. We're all journalists now, at least potentially, those of us who care to be. Twitter makes it possible for anybody, anywhere to do the fundamental job of journalism, which is to say, I'm at a place, I see something. Here's what I see. Mm -hmm. um, during, it was 10 o'clock, uh, Monday night, I was with one hand surfing TV news, the networks and the local channels, and channel after channel, it was dark, admittedly it was very difficult for anybody in, in a traditional news organization to get the big picture. Mm -hmm. And mostly what I saw was, one reporter with a microphone and an umbrella or a raincoat standing there trying to stand up straight and stammering into the wind and saying, it's dark here and it's windy and there's water here and there are waves there and that's what you saw on channel after channel. Meanwhile, go to Twitter, which I did, and in 30 seconds or less, you see reports of flooding here, flooding here, power out here, explosion here, 
much of it citizen generated, some of it unreliable, but in the aggregate far more informative than, than at the time I was getting from TV news. Mm -hmm. Because, it, I mean, interestingly enough, TV news at a time, this, this is kind of like the, the model that we've all sort of grown up with is that the, the, the all seeing eye is telling us what's going on, but the all seeing eye is one camera in one location, and this story is happening over 800 miles, and no no individual reporter or team of reporters can do what a thousand people being directly affected down in that flooded basement can do. More than a thousand. Yeah. I mean, yeah. thousands and thousands. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was, a critic of the media said that uh, if you didn't watch the debates with Twitter in one hand mm -hmm. and, and TV in, you know, in your other eye, uh, you, you got only half the story. Well, I think Sandra, Sandy, we're, on, we're that yeah. close. Now. Yeah, you yeah, can call, yeah, her you can call her Sandy. Sandy, yeah. you know, made clear that the proportions have changed. I mean, if you yeah. don't look at Twitter during these big news events, these vast news events, you're not even getting half well, the story. Now, see, I find that interesting because I think that it's too easy to generalize this. The example that you're giving, Charlie, is a brilliant example of where conventional media just simply can't can't tell this multifaceted story all at the same time. And so Twitter and individual accounts really make it a richer experience, if you can use that term. Uh, I would. I think yeah. so, yeah. But on the other hand, sitting listening to a whole bunch of people nattering on Twitter about what President Obama just said during the debate and whether that's accurate or not is just stupid. It's just a complete <laughs> I waste don't think of my so. time. I, don't I think much so. prefer to just sit there and actually watch the debate. I, you know, it's like it's like captions and it depends who you follow too if you're watching reporters uh -huh. the sun times had a you know its team of yeah. insightful analysts uh, tweeting for instance and and what happened for me as i watched that twitter feed during any one of the debates was it became very clear what the what the the, the flashpoints would be for that debate in the days to come partly because you're getting insight into reporters thinking also because you're getting you know, perspective, that was wrong, that was mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, I found it made the experience much richer. One of your points was that it's important to be careful about who you follow, isn't it? It yeah. is. But that's true, that's true in the old, dear old, yeah. lamestream yeah. media too. I mean, but, uh, CNN would put out some of the biggest uh, inaccuracies during the, the storm. I don't blame them for it, it's part of the process that happens, but everybody is subject to inaccuracies, so. In any traditional newsroom in a big storm, you've got people calling, right, saying, right. this is true, this is true, and right. what's the next thing reporter does? Right. They check it out. And then you've got Howard Stern's people out there trying to get on live to, well, to yeah. well, anyway. So, uh, Curtis, um, we, believe it or not, uh, we've just sat here and gassed away almost an entire <laughs> half hour, but <laughs> this is fun. I'm enjoying this. Sure. Um, what's, what's, your, what's on your list? What, what should we be paying attention to this week as we face an election and all this other stuff? Well, I mean, just the, the, the one thing we were just talking about was um, um, this big storm and w w what does it tell us about climate change and why has that been sort of missing from the presidential discussion? Mm -hmm. That's one well, thing. Well, it was. Mitt Romney said that President Obama wants to heal the earth and I want to help your family. Mm -hmm. and we had an interesting example these last few days that <laughs> <laughs> there may be a connection there. And, and Mitt Romney also at one point said that he wanted to return uh, uh, disaster relief to the states. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, I, I saw that several reporters were trying to ask him about whether he still thought that and he was not answering them at this yeah, point. Yeah. I can't imagine any politician would give up the... the Maybe Joe Walsh would give up <laughs> the, the, the opportunity to ask the federal government for disaster assistance. At this point, it seems almost trivial to quote uh, Stephen Colbert. Oh. It's just, you know, but, I was but do this, yeah. Colbert last night said something about, yes, this is a great idea. Return everything to the state. And then you can have your, you can uh, rely on the infrastructure that just washed out into the <laughs> ocean right. to uh, start rebuilding itself. The, uh, <laughs> the, the cover of this week's uh, Business Week, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, right. to use this full title, uh, mm -hmm. as a front page black type on red background and a picture of Sandy mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, devastation and it says it's global warming stupid yeah is it climate yeah. change stupid it's climate well I mean and and um, you know no less than the mayor of New York and the governor of uh, New York are now saying it's time we put this back on the table that we start actually talking about this so it's consistent uh, I just a few weeks ago talked to some climate scientists and 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 
while they are all, as good scientists are, reluctant to come to a firm conclusion, they're united, mm -hmm. the best of them, I think, in saying that this is, what, whatever this weather we're experiencing is, it's consistent with the theory that the climate is changing, yeah, that the earth yeah. is getting warmer. Yeah. The, the oceans are warmer, there's more water in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. there's more energy for these storms to pick up, and yeah, yeah. this will become, if global warming and climate change are, are accurate interpretations, this will become the new norm. And the onion, <laughs> you always like to quote the onion. I love it. I wouldn't yeah. be complaining about it. Right. The, and again, I'll probably right, so get I it. I thought we were going to get to a half hour Sorry. about Charlie quoting the, the onion. The headline this morning is, uh, <laughs> uh, apparently this thing we'll all have to get used to, or something like that. <laughs> well, I like the one about the uh, the New York uh, guy who, who was easily confused, who was spending the day in the bathtub full of batteries. <laughs> That's right. He'd gone out and bought batteries. <laughs> anyway, enough. I, 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 I wonder whether our political system is going to be able to deal with this issue at all. You know, Bill McKibben of 350.org, he says, we have one party that's owned by the oil and coal industry and one party that's terrified of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Right. Same thing could be said of the NRA. One is owned by it and the other is completely terrified by the yeah, NRA. Yeah. You know, we've got a, like a minute and a half or something left. Let's let's talk about something actually serious and local for a moment, okay, if we could. Climate is local. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Mayor Emanuel and uh, Superintendent McCarthy appear to be either radically changing or, depending on your point of view, completely eliminating caps. Do you have any sense of what's going on there? It's you the citizen cit action police policing? strategy. Police strategy. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's community policing. Community policing. Yeah. Which, of course, uh, some critics are saying ha has been pretty much just undone by McCarthy. He would say, obviously, that's not true. He's sending it out to the districts, which sounds kind of like Mitt Romney saying you're going to send, but maybe that's unfair. <laughs> it would make sense to try to integrate it into the police department on a whole. I, I, I haven't followed it very closely. It is a, it, it is a mechanism f for which community residents can, you know, have some input into mm -hmm. the policing. Uh, uh, it, I don't think it's been... Uh, utilized to the extent it could be. I don't know what they have in mind. I don't, I'm not sure they know what they have in mind. They um, haven't spelled it out. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, the, the yeah. All we know is the budget's going to yeah, zero, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. right. And, and, and McCarthy, so that's himself, a seemed, right. McCarthy himself seemed uh, reluctant or unable the other day, as I understand it. I wasn't there. Ben Jarofsky of the Reader, mm -hmm. I think, wrote about it to, to say that he didn't say exactly what's happening next. Right, so. right. But, but, you know, uh, uh, the police superintendent and the mayor have been pretty clear from day one of their reign that th their emphasis is cops on the beat. Right, right. And if right. a cop is on the beat interacting with the community and, well, and it, really doing that, isn't that community policing at its, at its essence? What's interesting about it, of course, is that it was part of a movement from, you know, 15, 20 years ago when there was a lot of concern about con community policing, uh, community involvement with the schools and the parks and all that. And it's worth noting as we close that uh, Don Moore passed away and there's going to be a memorial for him on Saturday. He was on the program just a few weeks before he died and he was really sort of the father of the, uh, the, the local school council movement in Chicago and somebody who really believed in democracy at the yeah. lowest level. Yes. And um, it's worth noting his passing. We got to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Curtis. We'll uh, see you again next week. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can watch us any old time you want, but you should check this out right here. See this, this address right here? You can click that in any time and watch the show anytime you like. You can also catch us on iTunes as an audio or video podcast and you can wait right where you are for another seven days and we'll be back with another show <laughs> right here on Chicago Newsroom. Thanks a lot. Don't move. See you next week. Bye.